Hello and welcome to the Monday, January 30th, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. It looks like there is yet another attack vector for internet connected DVRs and cameras. Last week we observed an increase in scans for port 5358. Uh, this port appears to be associated with the web service on devices API, something used by some of the same devices that we have seen being attacked by Mirai and similar bots in the past. If anybody has some packets with payloads, then uh, please send them in. I tried a little Netcat listener, uh, didn't really get anything uh, with that. So it may expect a certain response, uh, still trying to simulate that a little bit better. And if you are running OpenSSH, an older vulnerability originally fixed in 2015 has sort of come back with a new exploit. CVE 2015-6565 was originally reported as a denial of service and a possible privilege escalation vulnerability. The possible privilege escalation vulnerability is now confirmed with the release of a rather straightforward exploit. This is yet another case where a file, in this case the TTY terminal, is writable by other users and, and then code is executed by root. The vulnerability only affects OpenSH 6.8 and 6.9 and as I said has been patched a while ago. And then we have a couple of cases where ransomware is sort of cutting over into the Internet of Things realm. Now, the first one isn't classic Internet of Things. It did affect traffic cameras. And apparently mid-January, just a week before the inauguration, Washington, D.C. had to shut down a large percentage of its traffic cameras because PCs that you were used to control these cameras were infected by a ransomware. So in this case, it was the PC. It's a classic classic Windows PC that was infected, not the cameras itself. But the effect was that essentially these cameras were blind for a couple days until the city recovered from this incident. The second one is sort of a more typical in and of things event. It affected a hotel in Austria. And in this case, the attacker managed to infect or affect by again infecting some control PCs at the hotel with a ransomware that prevented the locks, the door locks from being used. Now, this apparently did not only prevent customers from entering their hotel room, but also prevented them from exiting their hotel rooms. I think uh, that's actually in particular concerning, and I'm surprised that this is actually possible. It always appeared to me that in hotel rooms, you could always leave your room, even if the lock, for example, lost power or became otherwise inoperable, but apparently this wasn't the case here. Now, again, it's not clear if the ransomware affected the lock itself or really just the PC controlling it. Uh, this ransomware also affected the billing and registration systems of the hotel, and the hotel ended up paying a ransom in order to get control over its systems back. And researchers looked at 282 different Android VPN apps and checked essentially how well they work and uh, also how legitimate they are as a VPN. Some of the applications actually turned out to be outright malicious. Not only did they intercept specifically bank and messaging apps, but 38% uh, of the applications contained some form of malware. Now, as I read the paper, they just ran it to virus total and everything that came back with more than five hits uh, with virus total uh, they considered uh, malicious sometimes uh, vpn apps themselves are considered uh, malicious by uh, some anti-malware so it would be worthwhile to look at this a little bit closer but uh, then as far as the encryption quality goes 18 percent of the applications do not use any encryption at all they well they still hide your ip address uh, to the target but uh, not the content to anybody intercepting it which of course is why a lot of people use vpns and 16 percent insert proxies that 
could then be used by the operator of the VPN to intercept and manipulate traffic. Sadly, it is not just free applications that are affected, but also premium for pay applications. And Google, a longtime critic of the current certificate authority ecosystem, is getting into the game itself by starting its own root certificate authority. Until now, uh, Google has been operating a subordinate certificate authority. Google is also planning to purchase two root certificate authorities from GlobalSign, which are already widely used and included in trusted certificate authority lists. This is supposed to jumpstart the process somewhat because, of course, it will take a while for operating systems, browsers and the like uh, to include Google's root certificate. The certificate authority will be run as Google Trust Services. That's the name they gave this project. If you plan to connect to Google services, uh, you should include these new certificate authorities in your list of trusted certificate authorities. But then again, Google is aware that this will take time. And that's why they say for the foreseeable future, uh, please you know, still include your regular list of trusted certificate authorities as it looks at it will take a couple of years for all of this uh, to become widely accepted. And uh, this certificate authority so far looks like it will only be used for Google's or Alphabet's internal purposes and doesn't look like they'll, they're going to get into the certificate business. But uh, of course, that's always possible later. Well, uh, that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.